Okay. Uh, so hello everyone and uh, welcome to this talk. Uh, so today we are going to discuss about uh, the art of bug fixing, uh, what nobody tells you. So just a few words about this talk. Uh, so today we're not going to discuss about learning how to use a debugger or debugging techniques uh, during development, but rather this talk uh, is about building a toolbox of techniques uh, to fix already identified bugs. Um, so the scope of this talk is limited to bugs that have already been identified. We are not going to look at techniques like fuzzing, for example, which is used to identify bugs automatically. And secondly, uh, this talk is about uh, what nobody tells you. Uh, so what I mean by this statement is that for me, it's, it's rather surprising that uh, talks about bug fixing or debugging are quite rare, although it's something that we as software developers uh, do every day. Uh, so the aim of this talk uh, is to bridge this uh, gap. And, and even if you do a Google search or, uh, or you look for talks on uh, YouTube for um, about debugging uh, or the art of bu or bug fixing in general, it's quite rare. Uh, so we'll try to bridge this gap today with this talk. Okay, so just a few words about me. Uh, I'm a software engineer at Event Store uh, since 2017, uh, a bit more than three years now. And uh, Event Store is the company but that builds the Event Store DB product, uh, which is a, basically a database. Um, and uh, the main power of our database engine is that uh, it keeps data as a series of immutable events. And uh, this is something that's very important, uh, healthcare or finance, for example, uh, where, or many other sectors as well, uh, where it's important uh, that you do not lose any information. Or, uh, so we are also happy to be a platinum sponsor of the developers conference this year. Uh, and uh, also we are hiring. So if you're interested in any of these uh, positions that you can see on, on my screen, then feel free to apply. Okay, uh, so I'm also um, very interested in general about uh, problem solving algorithms and I like to participate in programming competitions. So in 2017, uh, we participated in uh, a competition called the Krakaton, and some of you may know me from there. Uh, and we won it in 2017, and in the subsequent years, uh, we were problem setters for the competition. So it's a, it's a really great competition, and I encourage everyone to participate in the next edition in uh, February 2021. So let's dive in uh, to the main topic now. Uh, so fixing uh, so important. Uh, the simple answer is that uh, bugs can have catastrophic consequences. It could uh, result in loss of data, uh, inconsistent or horrible states. So I'm sure that uh, many of you have at least once in their lifetime uh, booted up into their Windows machine and it would just not start up. So that's one example of an unrecoverable state. Or loss of life. Uh, so if you are writing code for space shuttles or self-driving cars, then even the smallest bug uh, could result in catastrophic consequences and in loss of life. And secondly, bugs have a very high value for customers. So if you put yourself into the shoes of your customers and uh, they are reporting a bug to you and they are having a certain issue with your software. So we are not really going to care about the other great features that uh, your software has, uh, since they're, they're main, as long as their main issue is not resolved. So bug fixing brings a really high value to your customers. Okay, so the approach that we are going to take uh, today for this talk is that uh, we are going to build a toolbox of techniques, uh, like I mentioned earlier. Uh, so as you can see right now, the toolbox is empty, uh, but we are going to fill it in with different techniques as we go along. And uh, the idea is that there is no one-size one size fits all solution 
for bug fixing. So different techniques apply to different scenarios. And of course, it's uh, very important to use the right tool for the uh, You're not going to have uh, very good results. OK, so the first uh, scenario that we are going to look at is a situation where all you have is uh, log files. So it's a pretty common situation to be in. Uh, I can imagine uh, if your uh, someone is reporting a bug to you, whether it's your customer or someone else, then you don't have access to their systems. So all you'll have from the system is uh, potentially log files. So it's a pretty common situation to be in. And uh, so let's just look at a small code snippet here. Uh, so this is the code uh, for uh, in a, a restaurant, there is a function called canbook that you can see, uh, which takes an in, as, a, as input a date and a time. And basically what this function does is that it returns true. So if you look at this code snippet, um, there is a canbook function, which takes as input a date and a time. And uh, it returns true or false, depending on whether or not you're allowed to do a booking at this date and at this time. So for example, from Monday to Friday, the restaurant is open from 5 p.m. to 9 p.m. Uh, during weekends, it's open during the morning from 10 a.m. to 9 p.m. and on public holidays from uh, 10 a.m. to 9 p.m. And here we are assuming that uh, only the 25th of December is a public holiday. And when we call our function can book uh, with the 25th of December 2020 at 10 a.m., it's actually returning false. And that's a bug because uh, public holidays, uh, on public holidays, the restaurant should be open uh, from 10 to 9 p.m. So um, one approach that you could take maybe to try to approach this bug is that maybe you do a review of the code and uh, go through it and try to see where the bug could be. But uh, if instead I give you the logs for this particular run, so in this case, the logs are uh, outputting day of week, so we immediately know that the application went through this code path here. And uh, basically, that's the bug because uh, the intended path was to actually go through this uh, path here, uh, where uh, we are checking whether it's a public holiday. So basically, we've got an ordering problem uh, in our code, and this check here should be at the top. So I just want you to think for a second about what we've just done when we looked at the, this line in the log file. So what we've done is that we've logically inferred the code path taken based on the logs. And just by looking at this line, it has helped us reduce the search space to only two paths uh, instead of seven paths. And uh, one important thing here to note as well is that, so the presence of something in the log file helped us gain information, but also the absence of something. So if we are not seeing, uh, for example, weekend in our log file or public holiday, so we know that our application did not go through these paths as well. So that's something to consider as well. And uh, that's a very powerful technique. and. Uh, very often, based on log files only, you can deduce a lot of things. Uh, in my opinion, uh, log files are much more valuable uh, than just code reviews by themselves. So that's just a diagram of uh, the previous uh, code that we've shown. And so based on the logs and seeing uh, that it printed day of week, we were able to deduce that it went through this path. And uh, we also know that in our input, we've uh, put 10 a.m. So we know that it's gone exactly through this path. So we've inferred the whole code path based only on this line of code, uh, log, sorry. So what uh, we need to learn from this slide mainly is that more logging means more logical inference. And, and the ability to do more logical inference means that we are able to do better search space reduction. So secondly, you, you have control over your code. 
Uh, so feel free to add more logging. The next time that you're thinking about whether or not to log something, just log it because it might be helpful in the future, you don't know. And then uh, you've got stack traces, which are also uh, a very, uh, um, which are also very often present in log files and they can help you gain information about the code path taken. So how do you deal? Uh, sometimes you may have log files that are hundreds of megabytes in size. And so we are just going to go through a uh, quick technique here, what you can use. Uh, so we've got a log file here from a customer. Um, and as you can see, the log file is uh, 136 megabytes. It's quite large. Uh, so what we are going to do... again. Uh, could you increase the font size? We have some comments saying that they can't quite read what's going on the screen. Thank you. Okay. Uh, let me see if I can increase it. Oh, okay. I'm not sure I've got uh, uh, an easy way to increase it here, but what I'm going to do is that I'm just going to copy the command uh, into uh, VS Code here so that uh, you can view it. So uh, I hope it's a bit better now although I know it's approximately the same size. Oh, here it is. Okay, I think that's better. Um, so the idea here is to, um, uh, is to do an inverse filtering on the log file. So uh, very often, uh, instead of uh, filtering out, uh, filtering only what we are interested in. What we are going to do is just filter out things that we are not interested in. And uh, this can be done uh, very easily with a command, uh, with the grep command and with the dash v switch. Uh, so initially our file had uh, around 200,000 uh, lines of log. log. Uh, after we've uh, filtered out some stuff, uh, so here, for example, by just looking at the log, we can see that there's some redundant stuff that's repeated over again, and we are not interested in it. I just add grab, grab dash v. Uh, and then here we can see that uh, we've been able to just uh, reduce the number of lines in the log to 90,000 uh, instead of 201 line. And if we do this in sequence, uh, I've saved the command here so that we don't. So by just filtering out around four or five messages, we've been able to bring down the logs to um, 55 lines instead of 200,000. Uh, that you can have a, uh, that you can use in practice. Okay, so let's just uh, go back to the slides now, and we, the first one is uh, logical inference uh, in order to reduce our search space, and the second one is uh, inverse log filtering. Um, so here. In the previous example, we already had uh, the input that was causing the bug. But in practice, what may happen is that you don't actually have uh, the correct steps to uh, encounter the bug. And maybe the restaurant owner could tell you something that no one is turning up at the restaurant on public holidays. So I think that there's a bug uh, in your booking system. And then it would be up to you to go and find uh, the correct input that would be triggering the bug or the correct steps. So one approach that you could take uh, to do this is maybe review the code, guess where the bug is, 
write a small patch. Uh, you see that the tests are passing, you deploy it to production. Uh, but that's not the approach you could do much better. And the better approach would be that uh, the third line here, as you can see, is reproducing the bug. Important because it's also going to affect the subsequent uh, steps. Uh, so able to reproduce the bug, you write a failing test, which basically is a test uh, which uh, follows a series of steps to so your the test should fail because you have not patched it yet. Then you write a patch and now your test should pass. And then you can get your code reviewed or else. So, so the important thing in this slide here is that had not been able to reproduce the bug, you would not have been able to write a failing test. And uh, even worse, your colleague or code would not have been able to confidently say that the bug has been resolved. So reproducing bugs has got a lot of advantages. And here in this case, uh, the reproduction steps would simply be that you can the call function with this specific input. So advantages of reproducing the bug is that we can confidently confirm of the problem. And secondly, reproduction steps are a bit like a language for developers. Uh, to precisely describe the bug. Steps can be handed over to someone else. If you're going on holiday, then uh, at least you've uh, documented all the steps required to use the bug and someone else can pick it up and attempt to fix the problem. And then finally, reproducing the bug may make it easier to fix. So now we are going to look at some techniques uh, in the realm where we have been able to reproduce the bug. So in, in the first phase, we are going to look at a few techniques when we've been able to reproduce the bug. So this is really great. Uh, everything is beautiful. But then there's also the, also the case where uh, we've not been able to reproduce uh, the bug. And we are going to look at a few examples of what we can do in these situations. So the first question that we are going to ask ourselves is, was the previously, and uh, the bug was later introduced at one point in time in the code base. Um, so that's something pretty that can happen very often. And in this case, um, one tool that you can use, which is very helpful for these situations, is uh, git bisect. So bisect is just a subcommand of git. Okay, so we are just going to walk through a small example. Uh, uh, first of all, what does git bisect do? Um, so basically, you choose a starting commit and uh, an end commit. So the starting commit uh, does not need to contain the bug, and uh, the end, uh, the final commit uh, needs to uh, contain the bug. So what git bisect is going to do is that uh, you, you know that along this path from this good commit to this bad commit, there's uh, one point where the bug has been introduced. It is that it will choose a commit in the middle, uh, then tell you uh, to reproduce the bug at this specific commit. And if you are able to reproduce the bug at this uh, specific commit, then it means that the bug was introduced earlier. So you can basically reduce uh, the, the search space to the first half of all these commits. But uh, if uh, when you're running your code on this commit, you're not able to reproduce the bug, it means that it was introduced later. So we are just going to walk through a small example here. So I'm assuming here that uh, you are already familiar with Git. And uh, here we've gone uh, where we are only verifying if uh, the, the purpose of the application is to verify if a number is prime or not. So let just, let's just walk through a small example. Uh, 13 is a prime number, so the program will output prime. Uh, 12 uh, is a composite number, it will output composite. 
But then we realize that there's a bug when we enter 49. Uh, 49 is 7 times 7. It should be a composite number, but it's telling us that it's a prime. So we've already got our bad commit because uh, we know that there's a bug at this point in the code. But now we need to look also at the commit. So what I'll do now is just, just uh, switch um, to a commit where I think that uh, the bug was not present at, at this point yet, and then just run my application. So I enter 49 again, which should be uh, uh, a composite number. And that's right, it's telling me that it's composite. So it means that at this point in time, the bug was not yet introduced. So we've got a bad commit and a good commit, and we can start uh, our bisecting. So to start the bisecting, what, what we'll do is basically we just uh, type in git bisect start. Um, then we say git bisect uh, bad, and uh, the bad commit is already on the latest uh, commit and master. What we do is we say git bisect good with the good commit. Okay, so now as you'll notice, uh, Git has switched us to another commit. Uh, so it, it has just picked a commit in the middle. And what we need to do now is test this commit and see if the bug is present. So it's, it's just a yes or no question that we need to tell Git. So we enter 49 and it's, it tells us that it's a composite number. So the bug was not yet present. So we say Git bisect uh, good. Uh, again, we've not test this, uh, this uh, other commit. 49, it tells us that it's a prime. Uh, it's a bad commit. So we are now left with one commit to test. Okay, 49 again, it tells us that it's a prime. Uh, so it's a bad commit again. And here it is, uh, Git has already identified uh, the commit which has introduced the bug. So that's a pretty handy technique. And now what you can do is you can look at this specific commit and uh, you'll notice, uh, you, you, you need then to find out uh, where the bug was introduced in this specific commit. So in this case here, for example, an equal sign was missing here. So then we can just go ahead and fix it and then run our application again and the bug uh, is fixed. So now let's go back to the presentation. Uh, so git bisect is a very handy technique, particularly when you've got a very large number of commits. Uh, so it could work with thousands of commits due to the logarithmic nature of binary search, which uh, git bisect does. So let's uh, just add this to our toolbox. Uh, we've already got three items in our toolbox and uh, let's move on to other techniques. Okay, uh, so I'm going to go through this, uh, this question a bit more quickly so that uh, we can go through the other techniques um, in more detail because this one is something that happens pretty, uh, very often and I'm sure that uh, we are all very familiar with it. Um, so it's it's the it's the case where uh, you, the bug itself uh, spans uh, different layers. So, for example, it could be that you are sending uh, a post HTTP request to your server to try to create an entity on your database, but when you do it, you notice that no rows are being created. On your in your database. Um, so that's a pretty common uh, situation. And to try to analyze this situation, we are going to use the analogy of a um, So usually when you troubleshoot an electrical circuit, 
uh, let's say you're trying to turn on a switch uh, for a bulb and it's not turning on, then what we would do is that, assuming that the bulb is not the problem, usually it's uh, just the bulb, but that's the problem and we can just change it. Uh, but let's take a look at it in a more general way. Um, so what we, the, some questions that we could ask ourselves in that case is uh, whether there is power at all or not. So if we switch on another light bulb and we see that uh, there is, uh, the other bulb is lighting, lightning on, uh, then it means, uh, is lighting on, sorry, then it means that uh, the mains power is all right. And uh, maybe the bug, uh, the uh, problem is uh, another, in another place in the circuit. Um, so the important thing here is that what we are going to do next is that we are going to guess that maybe, okay, maybe the problem is with the power outlet where the light switch is taking power from. So we are going to uh, put our screwdriver to, uh, to test uh, the outlet and see uh, if there's power there at all. And then if there's no power there, we know that the problem is before this. So basically what, what we are doing, we are identifying test points in the electric circuit. So some examples of test points could be the power socket, uh, the outlet, the switch, uh, the apparatus, or even the wires between each of those components. So in the same way, um, if we look at the example of uh, our HTTP server where we were sending a request to the database, um, uh, we can apply the same techniques there. So the first thing is that we need to identify test points. So I've just uh, redrawn this electric circuit here in the form of another diagram where each orange point is a test point. Um, and in the case where we are using uh, of the database, for example, um, the different layers there could be maybe the HTTP server, the request handler, the OOM, and the database. So the way we would tackle this usually is to put test points uh, at different places and then see if everything is normal at those test points. Uh, so basically, uh, you could add test points by maybe uh, just logging a few things and then inferring things again, like we did uh, first with logging. Or maybe you could, you could even attach uh, your debugger to debug your application and add these specific test points and try to identify where the bug could be. Okay. So let's add this to our toolbox. And uh, now we are going to look at uh, we are still in the realm of where we are able to reproduce uh, bugs. So the next question that we may be asking ourselves is, does the bug happen in a deterministic way or not? So if the answer is no to this question, then it, it is for hitting a race condition. Uh, so we are just going to give a quick overview of what a race condition is. Um, for example, uh, it could be that in, in, in an integration test, you are trying to send HTTP requests uh, to a Docker container before it's even been initialized. Uh, so of course it will return an error. Or maybe you are checking that a file exists and you, att you attempt to open it, but the file is deleted in the meantime. So these are examples of race conditions. And uh, the basic concept of a race condition is that uh, there are two events that can happen uh, asynchronously. And uh, if the events happen in the correct order, then the race condition is not present. So in the first case, event one, one happens, so all is good. But in the case where event two happens before event one, then in that case, uh, a bug occurs. So we are going to look at quickly at an example of a race condition.
So I've set up a very small example just to illustrate the concept. Uh, I hope that you can see my screen all right here. Um, okay, so in this example, what we are doing is that basically we are setting up two threads. And they, uh, both of, of these threads have uh, a shared variable called uh, shared string. And what the first thread does is that uh, it checks uh, whether or not the length of this shared string is uh, zero or not. If it is uh, non-zero, then it will output this line. But if it is zero, then it will output this line. And the, the second thread, it sets uh, this shared variable. So there is a bug in this application where, for example, here we are not even checking if uh, the shared string is null or not. Uh, so the idea is that if uh, thread two uh, has not yet executed uh, this line of code, and uh, thread one executes this line of code here, it would result in a null reference exception because a shared string has not yet been initialized. Um, so what can we do about it? First, let's say we try to run our application and uh, everything is all right, it's not crashing. So we may think that everything is good. But then someone comes along and tells us that uh, I'm having a null reference exception and but you are not able to, to reproduce it. So you go and you look at your code and then you guess that maybe that's a race condition and uh, what's happening is that shared string is null here. So what you could do is in that case is you make it easier to reproduce the bug. So for example, we could delay this function, uh, this uh, line of code here by just sleeping for a few milliseconds changing the behavior of the code at all uh, in terms of the correctness. And then we, we run our application again. And here it is. Now we've got our null reference exception. So that's a very handy can use by adding delays into your code to generate race conditions. Another technique that you could use in that case without even adding any delays is that uh, is that you could set the, the affinity of the process to use um, a specific C, a CPU core. And Linux, what uh, we can do this, do this with uh, this command. So task set dash C0 means that the process that's going to run is going to be assigned to the CPU core, CPU core and it's not going to use uh, multiple cores at the same time. So what we are doing in this case is that we are ensuring that both threads are running on exactly the same CPU core. So we've not even changed anything in our code here. And now when we run it, you see that we were able to reproduce. So that's a pretty handy technique and as well. And the reason it happens uh, in my opinion, is that I'm not exactly sure why uh, it uh, it's, uh, when you set the affinity to the uh, to a specific CPU core. But um, my my opinion is that it's uh, just decreasing the degree of concurrency, and that by setting the CPU affinity, causing a certain ordering. Okay, this is our toolbox. So we've got two new techniques. Uh, adding timing delays to identify risk conditions and setting the CPU affinity to increase the chances of reproducing the risk condition. So I'm supposed to demo and uh, so I'll try to go a bit more quickly uh, with those two and they are quite simple. So the next question that we might ask ourselves is does the bug cause the application to hang? Um, in that case, then, it could be possible that you are hitting a deadlock. And uh, when you're hitting a deadlock, things are very confusing. You don't know what's happening. The application 
uh, appears to be unresponsive until maybe you restart it. And so we are going to look at a quick technique of how to deal with... Uh... So, one technique basically is to... Um, let me just open up the examples, so but it will be easier to explain. So first of all, what is a deadlock? Well, um, it, it's possible that two, thread, two threads are waiting for each other. Um, and uh, so they just stay in this state uh, uh, forever. Um, so it could happen also that a thread is, is waiting for itself. For example, the thread could have modified a certain state and then uh, it's uh, then spinning and waiting for, for itself. That's the example of a recursive lock. Um, it's not always that there are two threads involved. So in that, in, that, uh, in this example, again, we've got two threads and we are, uh, and the first thread is uh, locking on a, 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 on, on a first lock. The second thread uh, then uh, so, uh, start this example over again. So we've got two threads, and the first thread uh, is locking on lock one first, then on lock two. And the second thread uh, is locking on lock two first, then on lock one. So the problem that could happen in this case, which would trigger a deadlock, is that uh, so here I've added a thread that sleep uh, intentionally to trigger the deadlock. Um, the, the idea is that, let's say you are at this point in code on the thread one, you already, you've already taken a lock on lock one, and then thread two starts and it takes a lock on lock two. Then what would happen in this case is that now both of them are at this point in the code, so now thread one is trying to take a lock on lock two, but it's already taken, so it, it's just waiting. And similarly, thread two is waiting for lock one, which is already taken. So let's uh, just run. So both of them wait forever. So let's just run this example. And uh, right now I've been able to trigger the deadlock immediately, but usually it's uh, here, for example, it, uh, it did not deadlock. Okay, here again, it, it has uh, deadlocked. Uh, to show you it, a handy technique that you can use in these situa situations. And the technique is simply that you can uh, add, attach a debugger to the running application. So the debugger will show you exactly where both of uh, the threads are waiting. So let me just open up uh, my ID and so we are going to attach to the process here. Uh, I guess that it's this process, I hope so. waiting for the debugger to attach. And uh, we just pause the application. Ah, I guess what I have attached uh, to the wrong process here. <laughs> Let me just run it again and then attach again. Okay, here it is. Let's uh, just wait for the debugger to attach. And 
then we should be able to see that thread one is waiting, waiting here and thread two is waiting here. Okay, so the debugger is ready. And now we can see that in thread one, it's waiting on this lock here. And thread two is waiting on this lock. So we can then deduce that it's definitely a deadlock. Okay, we've got only a few minutes left. Uh, so I'm just going to go through the free last example, uh, which is pretty interesting. Um, so sometimes it, it happens that the bug uh, occurs only on CI but not on your machine. So how do you debug such uh, instances? Well, one technique that you could use in that case is that you could use a reverse shell. So uh, what exactly? Uh, usually there, there are some CI platforms like AppVayer that allow you to get access to the machine that's running. Uh, you could do a remote desktop, uh, but if that's not the case, then one handy technique that could come in is that you could use a reverse shell. Basically, you know that the machine uh, that's running on CI has got access to everything on the internet, but uh, you can't uh, connect to the machine uh, uh, by going inside the, the machine's network. So instead, what you are going to do is that we launch, uh, we listen on a socket on our own machine, and then make the, uh, the machine and CI connect to our own computer and then we get a shell on the machine. So I'm just going to... Uh, uh, this example in a few minutes. But so I've already set up uh, a pipeline here, which is running on macOS. And what we uh, just run the pipeline, and I'll explain what's happening. So we've just added uh, uh, three important lines to um, to our CI pipeline. The first one is the mo most important one, which is basically uh, it's connecting. That's my public IP address, and I've port forwarded a port on my machine. Um, so this line here on CI will launch uh, the, uh, a connection from the CI machine to my machine. And then what we are ju just doing here is an hour so that uh, the pipeline continues to run. Uh, so I'm just going to launch uh, a socket here uh, and listen on a socket. I'm going to run the pipeline. What's going to happen is that uh, the machine on CI is going to connect to my machine here. Uh, we are just going to look at the job while it's running. Okay, so it's it's just started and uh, uh, it's doing our usual stuff. It's checking out the repository, installing .NET, and then it will launch the reverse shell. Okay, so here you can set the connection incoming from the CI machine, and here we've got access to. Uh, machine running on CI and now we are uh, running as a user called render but we've got even got pseudo access so from this point on is that you can even launch your debugger attached to a process and see what's going on on the machine if you can't uh, figure out okay so we've we are uh, one minute. So I'll just summarize a bit uh, what, what we've gone through. Um, I didn't have enough time to cover, cover all the techniques, but um, 
basically, uh, these are the techniques that we've covered, but I'll just summarize a bit too in the case where uh, we were not able to reproduce the bug. That's the, uh, the other side of things. Uh, when we were able to reproduce the bug, this opened up a lot of possibilities for us, but it sometimes happened that, uh, happens that we are not able to reproduce the bug. Then in that case, what you could do is that if the bug happens really, you can just uh, simulate, uh, uh, run the application several, several hundred times and it could trigger the bug because uh, you've got the computing power to do it. And uh, if you do, I'm not going to go through it. But for example, if a bug the chance on, of 0.01 uh, of happening, uh, even if you are running the application for uh, uh, the actual probability that uh, it will uh, the, you will be able to reproduce the bug is actually 0 0.5, so it's just like you're flipping a coin, although the, although the probability is quite low. Uh, so that's under the technique. And so the last thing is that you're trying to reproduce a bug, but uh, you, you've tried everything in your power, but you simply cannot reproduce it. But in that case, what you can do is simply make a best guess and uh, attempt at fixing the bug. And finally, uh, when everything else fails, uh, you've, you've got no idea about uh, where the bug is. Uh, you've tried everything in your power. Then in that case, uh, what you can do is <laughs> simply take a break because, and, uh, because bug fixing can sometimes be very frustrating. Uh, you can spend hours trying to find a bug but it's good that you, you take a break uh, and then you look at things from a fresh perspective again after a few days or even a few months. Okay, so that's it. Thank you. And uh, I'm sorry I'm two minutes late, I think. Uh, so I guess uh, that I'll now uh, thank you everyone for watching and thanks to our hosts, uh, Neil and Chitesh, and uh, to the organizers of the conference. Thanks very much. I'll just pass on the, uh, to Neil and Chitesh now. Thank you very much. That was an amazing session, and I really enjoyed it personally, and I'm definitely trying to reverse uh, into my CI now. <laughs> thanks, thanks very much, Neil. Yes, that was a quality session, se session man. Thank you for uh, your time. Okay, if okay. anybody has any questions, Sean, how can they connect with you? Uh, yeah, so I'm on GitHub. Uh, you can uh, you can see my email address uh, here. So it's uh, sniper111 at gmail.com. And uh, you can just drop me an email and uh, yeah, you get into contact. Sniper111 at gmail.com. Great. Uh, yeah. All right. Uh, good. Thank you. Okay. Thank thanks you. very much. This presentation.